Intel Architecture Day 2021, hosted by Roger Kaduri, albeit a remote Roger Kaduri on video, covers four main topics. On the processor side, we have Alder Lake, and then they have Sapphire Rapids for the server side of things. And in graphics, we've got the desktop with the new wizardy names. There's also Pontevecchio, which is the mega high-end data center stuff, including the Aurora supercomputer. Dominic has already written up a news piece about the graphics. Luke has done a piece about the processors. I'm going to take a look at Intel video which runs to 2 hours 17 minutes and I've got my Skittles Sweet Heat limited edition on standby so each time Intel beclowns themselves we're gonna have Skittles and let's face it on past form I'm gonna be OD'd on Skittles without a shadow of a doubt so onward with the video welcome to architecture day 2021 in 2018, Intel highlighted the need for continued innovation in six key areas. Intel also identified four foundational compute architectures that are necessary for the next era of compute. Since then, Intel has continued to execute to this vision, shipping technologies and products like Ice Lake and Tiger Lake CPUs. No mention of Rocket Lake there. Can't understand why. Intel's first discrete GPUs on XELP architecture and Agilex FPGAs. In March, Intel announced our new manufacturing strategy, leveraging both internal and external fab infrastructure. In July, Intel unveiled one of our most detailed roadmaps yet, extending the promise of Moore's Law with new transistor, interconnect, and packaging innovations. And yes, indeed, Intel did unveil their new roadmap with new names for their processes, where they changed the nanometers to Intels and also changed from nanometers to A's. We covered that in some detail. Please welcome Intel's Chief Architect and Senior Vice President of Accelerated Computing and Graphics, Raja Kaduri. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all. Can't see Thank us. you for joining us for our third it's architecture day. Me and my fellow architects and engineers are so happy to be with you. No matter where you look, our lives are intertwined with digital technology. Every demanding workload we look into and every innovating customer we talk to have one meta performance ask, thousand x. They ask, can you make our workloads thousand x faster by 2025? Who? has ever asked for a thousand X performance in four years. I mean, it's a nice idea, but it's not us. This is data sensor stuff and specifically it's AI. I mean, that's three orders of magnitude. It's enormous. So immediately Raj is framing this whole thing, which is big stuff that's not for regular mortals on the desktop and such like laptops. This, he's looking at a big picture. We have a rich selection of compute engines to choose from several flavors of scalar vector matrix and spatial engines to combine and make hybrid computing architectures that deliver non-linear gains on demanding workloads. When we leverage the best transistor for a given engine, connect them through advanced packaging, integrate high bandwidth, low power caches, equip them with high capacity memories and low latency interconnect, we have hybrid computing clusters in a package. And the obvious question with hybrid compute cluster in a package is, hey, AMD with your x86 stuff, can you do this? Hey, Apple with your ARM stuff, can you do this? We can do this, we're Intel, we've got more stuff, a bigger variety of stuff than you. Yeah, things are a bit shaky at the moment, but look at all this stuff. We will begin by introducing two next generation x86 core microarchitectures. First, we will present the efficient core, a highly scalable microarchitecture optimized for multi-core performance per watt. Efficient core equals atom. Next, we'll present the performance core optimized for single-threaded performance and AI. Performance core is core. I hate that name, but Intel's sticking with it. So we've got atom and we've got core. Obviously, different architectures over each year of the roadmap, but we're mashing up atom with core. Then we will walk you through the architectural magic that combines these two cores to deliver our first performance hybrid architecture, Alder Lake. I am excited to introduce to you our new microarchitecture, previously codenamed Gracemont. 
When we started this journey, we wanted to deliver a scalable microarchitecture that could address computing needs across our entire spectrum of products. It's my honor to introduce Intel's newest, efficient x86 core microarchitecture. Thanks to a deep front end, a wide back end, and a design optimized to take advantage of Intel 7. Deep front end and wide back end, just for the FNAF FNAF, so close. But it wouldn't be fair. Without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to the chief architect of the performance core, Adi. Yo, Oz. Hey, hey Aja. <laughs> Take it away. Thank you, Aja. It's an honor to be here. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited for this opportunity. Adi Yoaz. I kind of misheard that name at first. Glad to see it on screen. To make the first public introduction of the new performance core architecture, which was previously codenamed Golden Cove. When we started this journey, we did so with an ambitious goal not only to deliver the highest performing CPU core Intel has ever built, but also to deliver a step function in CPU architecture performance that will drive the next decade of compute. If you look there, it says uh, performance x86 core. The third thing in the middle there, advance the arch stroke micro arch with new features. Obviously that's short for architecture. It's a problem I have with this new name for Intel graphics arc, which is Intel's take on GeForce and Radeon arc graphics is that Intel has this fabulous resource site called ARC, A-R-K, which obviously sounds the same as ARC, A-R-C, and in addition, when you're on the phone to someone from Intel, they'll mention ARC, meaning architecture. So this crops up again and again. ARC for graphics, I don't mind. It's just blooming confusing. Anyway, back to the show. I'm thrilled to announce that we delivered on all of our objectives. And it is my privilege to introduce Intel's new performance x86 core architecture designed for speed, pushing the limits of low latency and single threaded application performance. To keep driving general purpose performance, we have architected the machine to become wider, deeper, and smarter. It has a deeper out of order scheduler and buffers, more physical registers, wider allocation window, and more execution ports. Wider, deeper, smarter. The core that does everything. It does mobile, desktop, server, everything. It's like okie dokie. Why didn't they do this previously? What's the new magic source that means that this Performance x86 core is the one that's going to deliver? Let me now dive deeper into the details of our performance core architecture, starting with the machine's front end. The first step in building a balanced wider core is to widen and enhance the core's front end. Microoperation supply was improved both from the decoder side and from the microop cache path. The length decode is now doubled, running at 32 bytes per cycle, and two decoders were added to enable six decoded microops coming per cycle from the decoders. When delivering microoperations out of the microop cache, we can now get eight microops per cycle and the microop cache itself has increased to hold 4K instead of 2.25K micro operations. This allows us to better feed the out of order engine, deliver higher micro op bandwidth, and do so in a lower latency, shorter pipeline. To better support software with large code footprint, we doubled the number of 4K pages and large pages stored in the ITLBs. We have a smarter code prefetch mechanism hiding much of the instruction cache miss latency and improved branch prediction accuracy to reduce jump mispredicts. More of everything. Okie dokie, more is better. Except if more is better, why didn't they do this previously? This is feel good stuff at the moment. It's the sort of thing that glosses over latency or pipelines choking or some such. Going back to Pentium 4. Yeah, Pentium 4. When uh, the, back, back in the days of one gigahertz processors, increasing the length of the pipeline uh, was the big deal. And it just didn't work well. It, it, it just meant every so often the pipeline got choked. They didn't have data to feed into it and had to go back to square one. At the time it was brilliant 
and then it wasn't brilliant. This, more is better, perhaps. A completely new L2 prefetch engine was developed to leverage a deeper understanding of program behavior. The prefetch engine observes the running program in order to estimate the likelihood of future memory access patterns. It can identify multiple potential future sequences and can prefetch down multiple potential paths, each path at run ahead depth individually tailored for its estimated likelihood. This chart shows the performance improvement of our current 11th gen core architecture to the new performance core at ISO frequency. So this graph is showing if you compare these new cores used in Alder Lake with the Cypress Cove in Rocket Lake at 3.3 gigahertz, so clock speed uh, doesn't come into the equation, that you've got a 19% improvement. That's a decent number, obviously, but of course we're talking new process, Intel 7 or 10 nanometer, after we've finally got away from 14 nanometer after goodness knows how many years. So welcome but they appear to be combining two gains here, process and new architecture. Finally, I really want to thank the team of talented architects and engineers at Intel that made these advancements possible. Thank you all for your time. Back to you, Raja. And what you just heard there was a man saying thank you, thank you, thank you for letting me move on to the new process, which means I can finally deliver the work I've wanted to deliver probably for many years uh, because we just haven't been able to deliver this design until now. And I will say this, they're promising a monumental amount. So the question is going to be, how are these performance and efficiency cores going to be combined in Alder Lake? Thank you, Adi. With our new performance and efficient course, you have seen the details of one of the biggest advancements in x86 architecture in over a decade. So let's put that in context. We have shown you this roadmap of coves and mounts in the past. You may have noticed we have changed our nomenclature since. Our mounts were designed for the best area efficient multi-threaded performance. Our cores were designed for maximum single-threaded performance. Now, while efficient core truly excels in throughput efficiency, it's also getting a boost in single-threaded performance. And the performance core is not only pushing the limits of low latency and single-threaded performance, it's also getting a boost in multi-threaded performance with additional AI acceleration. But where we want to be is here, where we can combine the best of both best of both in one system to get the raw performance of the P-Core with the scalability of the E-Core. To share more, I would like to invite our client architect, Rajshree. Thanks, Raja. And hello, everyone. I'm really excited to share with you unique solution we have developed to ensure two new cores you just heard about. Efficient core and performance core work seamlessly together so we can maximize system performance and efficiency. As we all know, performance expectation can vary drastically for different computing tasks. Scheduling goals, software transparent, real-time adaptive, scalable from mobile to desktop. This is the guts of what Alder Lake is gonna be doing and uh, I assume every processor in future from Intel. So uh, we have had Lakefield, but putting that to one side, this is the first serious uh, go at this software transparent uh, that's interesting because if you think about optimus as used by nvidia uh, so does your laptop want to use the integrated graphics or does it want to use the uh, add-in graphics from nvidia and it's done by app uh, i'm using email use the igp i'm using steam or a specific game go for it with the proper graphics. Uh, it, it's done by name, it's just a table. Scalable from mobile to desktop. I must confess, my main interest here is whether this has any relevance to desktop whatsoever. You understand with mobile, you're running on battery, you wanna save power, you wanna improve battery life. Therefore, if you can run on the efficiency cores and only switch over to the performance cores when necessary, that's obviously a good thing for the desktop. Who gives a damn about Atom? Give me the juicy cores. So this is a big deal. Only a hardware solution could meet all these requirements. So we developed 
Intel Thread Director technology. Intel Thread Director. If you heard Threat Director, you're wrong. Thread Director. This is the first time I've heard of this and this is suddenly looking deeply exciting. Right now, if I had another bag of Muskittles, I'd be opening this bag and pouring Skittles in. This is the opposite of Intel be clowning themselves. I'm genuinely excited. Let's walk through a scheduling example on a real scenario. Let's say a user starts a performance critical task such as a game or a content creation software. Those threads first will be assigned to our performance scores. Now, if a background task such as, you know, email sync or network drive backup starts, those lower priority, less demanding tasks will go to our efficient course. Next, let's assume a case where all the performance cores are busy, but a thread needing even higher performance becomes ready, such as an AI thread using CPU AI instruction. In this situation, Thread Director provides what we refer to as a hint to the OS indicating there's a higher performance thread needing attention. Your processor is working flat out. All the calls are running simultaneously. I did not expect to hear that about Alder Lake. I expected it to be either low or high performance and switch between the two, but the idea they're all running simultaneously. Okay, and then along comes an AI thread that demands uh, extra resources. So your, your OS is going to have to do something. It's going to have to switch things around. And Thread Director will provide a hint to your OS. That says to me Windows 11, because I'm not aware that that's a thing in Windows 10. So Alder Lake and Windows 11, which is obviously going to be a match, but it suggests that Thread Director wants to talk to Windows 11. Thread Director also identifies a candidate thread that could be moved from performance cores to efficient cores based on relative performance ordering, making room for that AI thread. This is where the dynamic nature of our innovation shines. Nothing is static based on any software. Everything is dynamic based on the current context of whatever is running on the system, all augmented by hardware telemetry. This is our animation explanation of the technology. Let's see it in action on Alder Lake, running Windows 11, incorporating Threat Director feedback in real time. Okay, so an animation showing Thread Director running on Windows 11, as I thought. <sighs> okay, this might be where an animation might be my first skittle. In typical cases, we see combination of scalar and vector instruction, mix of important and background tasks we are going to see how Thread Director helps OS with placement of these threads. In the first example, we have a representation of a typical media content creation usage we see with real-world software. The green threads that you are seeing here are mostly scalar instruction. The dark blue threads that you see are vector instructions, and the light blue are background tasks. The vector instructions, for the most part, get prioritized on performance scores as they require more performance, while some of the green threads and the light blue thread go to efficient cores. Visualization for illustrative purposes only. Fiery watermelon. Whoa. Lastly, I do want to show something else. I want to show fully multi-threaded synthetic workload running same instruction mix. Fully multi-threaded synthetic illustration. Scorching pineapple. Here, all threads go use all available core. To enable this level of fine-grained coordination for real performance, Intel jointly worked with Microsoft to incorporate this revolutionary capability into upcoming Windows 11 release. Speaking of which, I would like to invite Mehmet Egun from Microsoft to share more details. Hello. 
Throughout the Windows 11 development cycle, my team has been working with our colleagues at Intel to enlighten and optimize our upcoming OS to take full advantage of the performance hybrid architecture and Thread Director in particular. Much of this work centers around the OS Thread Scheduler, the kernel component that decides which threads to run and where to run them. These decisions have a huge impact on user perceived performance and power consumption, especially on devices built on hybrid processor architectures. The description here about how Windows 11 is working with the Thread Director uh, sounds logical. It is worth pointing out if you have the Alder Lake with uh, 8 performance cores, 16 threads, and 8 efficient cores, 8 threads total, 16 cores, 24 threads. Clearly, if you had uh, 12 performance cores with 24 threads, you wouldn't need to do all this because all the cores would be equal. They're doing this precisely because they can't cram in as many cores as they want in a given processor, hence you have to have a mix of cores. That's not to say this approach is wrong, but at the moment it sounds like one heck of a lot of work to cover up a fundamental problem. But of course it could also be the way of the future. We are very excited about the performance benefits of this technology and the potential it holds for future innovation. With that, I would like to hand it over to my colleague Ari Gihon to give you more details about Alder Lake SOC. Thank you. Hi everyone. Alder Lake supports the latest state-of-the-art industry standards in memory, I.O. and connectivity for no compromised PC experience. Let's get to know Alder Lake. Alder Lake was built for performance. We started with desktop architecture and scaled all the way down to Alto Mobile. Scalable client architecture, so the desktop is showing an 8 plus 8 configuration, bearing in mind little cores do not have hyperthreading. The mobile BGA type 3 is 6 plus 8, and ultra mobile is 2 plus 8. Both P cores and E cores are built as interchangeable slices that include a portion of the last level cache, allowing us to build multiple die topologies spanning Adelic's huge design range. The accelerators and IOs are connected through an hierarchical structure configured to support the required bus width, queue sizes, number of ports, and memory access feature set. Adderlick leveraged the Axie LP graphics from Tiger Lake, ported to Intel 7. It supports 1080p gameplay and 12-bit end-to-end video pipeline. So we can see here that desktop has 32 execution units of graphics, mobile, ultra mobile have the up, up to 96 so mobile ultra mobile have full graphics and the desktop has some graphics we expect that and assuming those block sizes are proportionate looks like desktops doing more with PCI Express as well and I'm not seeing Thunderbolt on the desktop oddly having said that it's just an image but you can see Thunderbolt on mobile and ultra mobile, not on desktop. Let me show you the memory capabilities. Alder Lake delivers a separate set DDR technologies with Intel's unique FI, supporting DDR4 and DDR5, as well as LPDDR4 and LPDDR5 in a single chip leading the industry to this major memory transition. Desktop should be straightforward, mobile, while well, we've seen uh, laptops that go with the LP memory or with the more common or garden, and the LP certainly helps graphics performance, and we wouldn't be shocked, would we, to see some small form factor uh, all the leg systems that have memory on board as well. If you think this is cool, we also upgraded our PCIe capabilities. Alder Lake is leading the transition to PCIe Gen 5 with up to twice the bandwidth of Gen 4. It supports up to 16 lanes and reach 64 gigabyte per second, ready for the next generation of SSDs and discrete graphics. So funny thing, I'm seeing up to 16 lanes of PCI Express Gen 5. At the moment, Intel has just stepped up from Gen 3 to Gen 4 and they went from 16 to 20. And here we're going from uh, to 16 plus 4 Gen 4s. So it's an improvement without a shadow of a doubt. There's just part of me that feels that given we've got uh, SSDs as well as graphics, 
more perhaps i mean it sounds a bit uh, greedy to be asking for more when the thing's still on the slide rather than them physically in front of me i'm not sure that 20 lanes of pci express is going to be enough uh, from the processor 24 feels like it'd be better so let's see how all of this works together the challenge of building such a highly scalable architecture is that we need to meet the incredible bandwidth demands of the compute and IO agents without compromising on power. I'm looking at the Alder Lake interconnect here with those monumental numbers. They're just absolutely vast. And it makes you wonder, AMD already has Infinity Fabric, which is based on PCI Express. What would happen if for Zen 4, they were to bump up uh, PCI Express 4 to 5, uh, memory from DDR4 to DDR5, and also simply increase the fabric speed uh, and reduce latency? I wonder what that would be like. Finally, I'm working with the team on Alder Lake in the lab now, and I can't wait to have one at home. Thank you, and back to you, Raja. Alder Lake scalable from 9 watts to 125 watts. I've seen that claim all previously, and it's still remarkable seeing it on the slide. Right now, Alder Lake, I am well, this presentation has achieved its desired effect, which is I was decidedly unimpressed by the idea of Alder Lake on the desktop, which is where we're going to see Alder Lake first because we've got laptops uh, coming apparently early next year. So Alder Lake is going to land on the desktop. And my thoughts were uh, the efficiency cores, atom cores, whatever. It's eight cores. It's a new process, but moving from eight cores to eight cores plus some stuff. <laughs> DDR5 probably going to be problematic in the first instance. PCI Express Gen 5 for storage isn't a thing. So it's like okie dokie. Uh, and then the next version is Raptor Lake and so on, presumably improving. This is sounding impressive, particularly in conjunction with Windows 11. I am now feeling upbeat. Thanks, Eric. We look forward to seeing Alder Lake in customers' hands later this year. Let's change gears from hybrid computing to visual computing. I'm sure you all want to hear a little bit more about our discrete XCGPU architectures. If you step back and look at what we have been doing recently, you'll see that we have made tremendous progress on integrated GPU hardware and software in less than three years. We have effectively doubled performance year over year, two years in a row now. First with Gen 9 to Gen 11, and then with Gen 11 to XELP. Tremendous improvements with IGP in less than three years. I wonder, how long has Raja been working at Intel? Could it be three years? I think it might be. This is a great time to be entering the high performance PC graphics market. Why is Intel getting into doing discrete graphics now? There are plenty of good reasons, but when Intel planned this move some years ago, they could not have begun to imagine that right now in 2021 and moving into 2022, that there'd be monumental pent up demand for graphics at absolutely ridiculous average selling prices. I imagine Intel is keen as mustard to get some graphics cards on sale for 400, 500, 600 pounds dollars. I mean, I can't believe they can push much beyond that point, but that what used to be expensive territory, which is now mainstream, if they can supply competent hardware, it'll sell. We recently unveiled ARC which is a brand for our visual computing products. The word arc is used to describe the narrative flow and the various plot inflections of a story. Every gamer, game, and creator has a story, and every story has an arc. Story arc. Building great GPU hardware is necessary, but nowhere sufficient. Great software, plays a critical role for the user experience. To discuss the progress we are making on software and user experiences, please welcome the leader of our GPU software team, Lisa Pierce. Thanks, Raja. 
With our first high-performance gaming GPU, it goes without saying the performance and quality are job one. First, at the heart of our focus is the design of the core driver itself. Intel. Display drivers matter. The world. No, really? Can this be true? We had no idea. Now, we are always about new APIs and engines, since new games are always pushing up the visual quality bar. For the last three years, we've been co-engineering new features for DX12 Ultimate with Microsoft. We're excited that at launch, we will support hardware-based ray tracing, mesh shading, and sampler feedback. Together, these technologies deliver next-gen visuals in games like Hitman 3, Chivalry 2, and many others. We've also been working closely with Epic, and I'm excited to tell you that Unreal Engine 5 runs on our discrete graphics GPUs today. We can't wait to see what game developers will do next in their next generation engines. At launch, we'll also enable updates to our user controls to help gamers take advantage of these technologies, including support for AI-assisted virtual cameras, game highlights, and of course, capture for streaming that will make use of our high performance and quality hardware encoders. Support for ray tracing, support for APIs, obviously welcome. How well they do this is a wholly different question. Till we see the hardware in action, eh, it, it's just words. Uh, you have to admire Intel's ambition, admittedly, but ray tracing, you know, NVIDIA's first go with ray tracing was not impressive. Uh, the idea that Intel could get it right out of the box would be really surprising and truly impressive. We shall see. Given a fixed amount of performance potential in a GPU, gamers are forced to make a choice between high quality and acceptable performance. There are cases where you have content that already runs close to 60 FPS at 4K, and the frame rate can be further increased by upscaling. Or you can have a more recent content like ray tracing that needs a performance boost even to achieve playable frame rates. Over the years, games have developed various technologies to reconstruct a high-res image from fewer pixels. These technologies use novel algorithms to reconstruct details from neighboring pixels in space or time, but they're often accompanied by issues like blurring or ghosting. And these technologies can often fall short with high-quality rendering, like ray trace reflections and shadows, detailed geometry, or high-res textures. Additionally, there are computational overhead in doing these operations. Ultimately, we want to target this region of high performance and high quality. Our solution to this problem is XESS. I see a chart with performance and quality, low quality image, high quality image, no scale, no metric, no nothing. I eat Skittle. XESS is an easy to integrate API and it fits within today's game engine flow. It uses deep learning to synthesize images that are very close to the quality of native high-res rendering. It works by reconstructing sub-pixel details from neighboring pixels, as well as motion-compensated previous frames. This reconstruction is performed by a neural network trained to deliver high performance and great quality. A neural network. Where is this neural network? Is it inside your PC? Is it connected over 5G or some other really fast communication somewhere in the cloud? Hmm, makes you wonder. Anyway, let's see what it does. This is a demo prepared by Renz using Unreal Engine. We can see the demo rendering real time in 4K, but in reality, the engine renders to a smaller 1080p render target, which is upscaled to 4K by XCSS. Compared to rendering in native 4K, there's no visible quality loss. Upscaling from 1080p to 4K with XCSS gives the same quality image as rendered in native 4K. In this scene to the right, you can see the actual content rendered by the engine. The left side shows how this 1080p image is upscaled by XCSS to achieve the final high quality result. Rendering to a smaller 1080p render target allows to significantly reduce the rendering time and achieve higher frame rates. The cost of upscaling operation remains relatively small compared to the overall render time. Thanks to the use of AI-assisted scaling, we can also achieve up to 2x performance boost. And now, games that would only be playable in low-quality settings can run smoothly at 4K. Thanks, Lisa. Hi, everyone. It's time for our new GPU microarchitecture to be introduced to the world. This microarchitecture, which we call XEHPG for high-performance gaming, 
is the convergence of our XELP, HP, and HPC microarchitectures. XEHPG is engineered to deliver great scalability and compute efficiency with advanced graphics features. To deliver scalability beyond XELP in XEMAX and build enthusiast class hardware, we've had to rework the fundamental architecture of our GPU. Thanks, David. As David hands back to Roger, I have to say that sounds promising. Obviously scant on detail, but promising. I'm also going to say the last time I heard Roger do a presentation, which was when he was at AMD, I ended up buying two Vega 64 graphics cards, and I haven't forgiven him for that yet. Last year, I told you that XEHPG GPUs would be built with an external foundry partner. Today, I'm happy to unveil that our partner is TSMC, and Alchemist GPUs are built on the N6 process. While our post-silicon and software teams are working very hard to get this to you, our design and architecture teams are busy creating the next few generations of our gaming GPUs. Here I have the code names. Battle Mage with XE2, Celestial with XE3, and Druid after. A, B, C, D, Alchemist, Battle Mage, Celestial, Druid. As we know, Gamers Nexus has already poked holes in this with the Celestial thing. Uh, the concern, obviously, is that Intel has to deliver on its roadmaps, and we don't know how good any of them are going to be at any point. What power will they require? How hot will they be? How good will they be? All these are unknowns. If Alchemist is competent, I will certainly buy it. How many others will I buy over the years? Who knows? Let us hope I don't have to wait for G for Gandalf before it becomes good. Let's hope it's great from the very first iteration. The technology building blocks for this architecture have been years in the making. We've been waiting so long for Sapphire Rapids. I think it merits. Sizzling strawberry. Oh go. This includes a performance x86 core built for the data center. New accelerator cores, new memory architecture, new fabric architecture, new I.O. architecture, and a host of new software and security features. This is a big deal for Intel and a big deal for the entire data center ecosystem. To tell you more, let's bring on Silesh, our chief architect for data center. Hey, Silesh, hey, take us away. Uh, thanks, Raja. The new performance core in Sapphire Rapids brings significant scalar performance improvements. In addition, the multiple integrated accelerator engines and increased core counts provide a massive increase in data parallel performance. Furthermore, these performance cores are paired with right levels of cache and industry-leading system capabilities of DDR5 and PCI Gen 5 to provide optimal balance across compute, memory, and I.O. So we're having x86, SOC, DDR5, PCI Express Gen 5, essentially a repeat of what we heard for Alder Lake. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sapphire Rapids. I would like to call on Chief Engineer Naveen Nasif to introduce the breakthrough SOC architecture that is Sapphire Rapids. Thank you, Silash. At the heart of Sapphire Rapids is a new modular tiled architecture that allows us to scale the balanced Xeon architecture beyond the limits of the physical reticle. Sapphire Rapids is the first Xeon product built using EMIB, our latest 55 micron bump pitch silicon bridge technology. This innovative new technology enables independent tiles to be integrated in a package to realize a single logical processor. The resulting performance, power, and density are comparable to an equivalent monolithic die. Remember, when AMD did this with their chiplets, this was a terrible idea with glued together bits of silicon. According to Intel, now it's genius. No more monolithic, we're using tiles. I would like to invite Arijit, the lead architect on Sapphire Rapids, to tell us more. Thank you, Sailesh. One of my key focus areas on Sapphire Rapids was to explore breakthrough improvements for the high levels of common mode tasks causing overhead that we see in data center scale deployment models. 
Instead of traditional approaches, we embarked on a new direction using optimized acceleration engines. We found these engines to vastly improve processing of these overhead tasks and enable greater utilization of the performance course for higher user workload performance. Epic looks so old. What you want is accelerators. Just having loads of cores, no good. And we are not done with memory just yet. In addition to support for DDR5 and Optane memory technologies, Sapphire Rapids also offers a product version that integrates HBM technology in package for high performance in dense parallel computing that is prevalent with HPC, AI, machine learning, and in-memory data analytic workloads. Looking forward to seeing how much it costs to buy Sapphire Rapids with HBM on board. I imagine that's not cheap, but it sounds impressive. This chart shows the speed up we are modeling in our architecture models and with some early silicon measurements on Death Star Bench and other example proxies that is normalized at the per core level. And as you can see, we are seeing some great improvements in performance. Cascade Lake, Ice Lake, Sapphire Rapids, no mention of AMD Epic. As one would expect, Sapphire Rapids is a complex undertaking. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank the teams across all of Intel that are bringing Sapphire Rapids to market. Sapphire Rapids has sounded impressive for a terribly long time. Obviously, Intel needs to deliver it. Then we need to see how much power it takes, what it costs, and whether or not their clever new technologies kick Epic to the curb. I think it's clear that Sapphire Rapids is going to trounce the existing Xeons. That's no surprise. But what cost, what power? Skipping past some doubtless fascinating items, we're going to move on to Ponte Vecchio, the big graphics we've been waiting on for a while. The graphics that will power Aurora. Fantastic, Naru. There is a larger software ecosystem story to tell here. We look forward to share more at Intel on. The first step in making progress is to admit we have a problem. At Intel, we had a problem, almost a decade-long problem. We were behind on throughput compute density and support for high bandwidth memories, both of which are essential metrics for HPC and AI and the cornerstones of GPU architecture. The first chart is FP64 flops. The blue line is Intel versus the green line, which is the best in the industry. Hmm, green line. Wonder who that might be. The second is a similar chart for memory bandwidth. As is obvious, the gaps were quite large. And in 2017, when GPU architecture started adding special engines for matrix processing with AI data types, the problem got worse. We set for ourselves some very ambitious goals. We started a brand new architecture built for scalability, designed to take advantage of the most advanced silicon technologies. And we leaned in fearlessly. Let me hand it over to Hang to walk you through this brand new architecture, XEHPC. I'm here to talk about how we design XEHPC architecture. How do we scale our architecture to realize the vision set up by Roger? Scaling to four GPU for large problem is a popular configuration. Six GPU per node may look familiar to you, as this is the topology of Aurora Accelerator Network. A popular configuration for AI and large problem is to have eight GPUs in an OEM form factor for universal baseball design. That's a lot of connections. Six for Aurora, eight for AI. Hong talked about the amazing XCHPC architecture. My team and I, along with the help of our partners, IP, test, packaging, process technology, and manufacturing teams had the challenge and privilege to bring this architecture to life as the Ponte Vecchio chip. The Ponte Vecchio chip, as you see in this picture, is composed of several complex designs that manifest in tiles. Compute tile, Rambo tile, XC link tile and a base tile with high speed HBM memory, which are then assembled through EMIP tile that enables a low power, high speed connection between the tiles. 
These are put together in a four-rows packaging that creates that 3D stacking of active silicon for power and interconnect density. I want to walk you through a few big challenges from the many that we had on Ponte Vecchio. Fovros was critical for Ponte Vecchio 3D stacking, and we have some key learnings with its implementation, both functional and physical. We had to transfer data at 1.5x speed over our original plan to minimize the number of Fovros connections. We also had to lock the Fovros locations early in the design on all the tiles, which meant that the floor plan was locked very early. Sounds like they realized they didn't have enough connections, therefore they had to increase the speed of those connections to make it work. High power multi-tile package posed its own challenges related to signal integrity, reliability, and power delivery as there was no precedence internal or external to Intel. Fovros implementation was complex and time consuming. Just for context, Ponte Vecchio has two orders of magnitude more Fovros connections than any previous Intel designs. Two orders of magnitude is 100, 100 times more Fovros than, say, Lakefield. Surely that means the number of bumps. It's a monumental step up, that's for sure. It is highly gratifying to see Ponte Vecchio powered on and successfully running hundreds of workloads and hitting some industry-leading performance numbers on A0 silicon. Here in my hand is this marvel, Ponte Vecchio. Look at it! Look at the size of the thing! Thank you, Masuma. You and your team have done a fantastic job. Thank you, Raja. It's a fact that she's not a very large lady. Nonetheless, that's just monumentally large piece of hardware. That GPU Masuma handed me is A0 silicon, as she noted, which is our first stepping. It already produces greater than 45 teraflops of sustained vector single precision performance, validating that our compute tiles are healthy. We also measured greater than five terabytes per second of sustained memory fabric bandwidth which validates our Fovoros 3D packaging technology, and over two terabytes per second of aggregate memory and scale-up bandwidth, and this proves all our EMI bridges are very healthy. Thank you for joining me and my colleagues and for being part of our architecture journey. Please welcome a famous Intel architect and now Intel CEO, Pat Gelsinger. I appreciate the opportunity to join you as we bring Architecture Day to a close. I am extremely proud of what our technology leaders just showed you. This was the result of years of hard work by the most talented team of architects and engineers in the world. You have just seen one of Intel's most significant advances in x86 architectures in over a decade. It's that big. For generations, the primary driver of compute was process, lithography, geometry, getting to the next node, all the exciting foundational innovations that will power products through 2025 and beyond. We laid out one of the most detailed process and packaging roadmaps we've ever produced at our recent Intel Accelerated event. Looking ahead, we face daunting compute challenges that can only be solved through revolutionary architectures and platforms. The good news? We already have developed many of these. Microarchitectures for performance and efficiency, heterogeneous computing at every level and in every dimension, from subchip to board to system to data center and from edge and endpoint devices to network to cloud, Everything is designed to intelligently use the best compute resource, the optimal architecture for each task. So my takeaways, Intel earned themselves three Skittles for uh, two for showing blatant simulations uh, of uh, workloads and one because Sapphire Rapids is so blooming late. My personal takeaway is Windows 11 is going to be hugely significant for uh, the way going forward with Alder Lake in particular. And as everything from here on in with Intel is going to be a combination of cores, Windows 11, yes. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how much of the new hardware runs on Windows 10 or runs correctly on Windows 10. But Windows 11, there's going to be no uh, avoiding it for us. Alder Lake on the desktop 
uh, it's hard to be enthusiastic. Eight cores plus some little cores. Judging by the leaks we've seen, power is going to go up, which is not good. What these little cores bring to the party, you wouldn't have thought a great deal. However, Intel's trying to convince us otherwise, and I'm feeling more enthusiastic about Old Lake. Nonetheless, Raptor Lake and later lakes you would think would be more interesting. So Alder Lake might be okay. Alder Lake in mobile, that should be a big step forward provided it functions as Intel is predicting, promising, telling us. On the graphics side of things, the Alchemist and such like named meh, Arc, meh. however, if Intel can deliver graphics that can game properly at 1080 or even 1440, and they sell them for a sensible price, there's a market. I'll buy them, you'll probably buy them, we'll all buy them because NVIDIA is telling us 2022 is going to be just a, a nightmare for graphics. So if Intel can step into the market with hardware at a sensible price that delivers, sure thing, I'm there. And I love the idea of building a system powered by AMD with Intel graphics. That just strikes me as hysterical. Uh, the upscaling technologies they demonstrated, or bit you know, demonstrated, if that works correctly, great, happy. Uh, having some competition, three manufacturers in the market is a good thing. The big hardware, Sapphire Rapids, Ponte Vecchio, if Intel can deliver this uh, soon and it works brilliantly well, what's not to like? It's it's outside of my direct uh, area of interest but obviously we all use this hardware unbeknownst to us because it's the cloud all these services we use they run on hardware like that uh, so we shall see uh, I really am looking forward to seeing statements that the Aurora supercomputer is up and running and doing useful work because that means that Intel will have how many years I don't know how many years they are behind schedule now many years behind schedule so they'll pull themselves at least some way back into the game but nonetheless intel's promises and roadmaps and so on about processes and such like you know were wholly separate to this this was not to do with intel manufacturing at all it's to do with design soc x86 rather than arm or risk 5 uh, packaging tsmc which therefore they can roll into idm 2.0 uh, as to when intel so, uh, fabs and manufacturing can get back on track goodness knows but uh, Pat Gelsinger clearly is determined and Roger is clearly a very important man at Intel wow that was a long one and only three skittles